medical court may or may not accept. That's all. It's just a credible source of information. So me as a sovereign and my and my court and my suit, am I a credible source to issue a letter of obligatory? <clears throat> In theory you are, but, but you don't have to do that. And the reason is, is because you're not foreign to the system. In fact, quite the opposite. You own the system. You know? You're, you're one of the people. The sovereignty of the government is in the people. The, sovereign, the government has no sovereignty. Okay? All they have is authority that has been granted to them by the sovereign people. And they have to stay within that. And if there's no specific grant of authority, they can't do it. Now, I realize, I, I should say, they may not do it. They're doing a lot of things today that are absolutely unconstitutional. Okay? I suspect Social Security is unconstitutional because the, the, uh, I think they're, they've justified Social Security on the uh, health and, and welfare clause of, of the uh, preamble. But I don't think that... Well, I know that the, the preamble is just general concepts and does not provide specific authority to them on that level, okay? So, um, in fact, there's been cases where people have tried to sue the government because the government failed to protect them. And the courts have said that there is nothing in the Constitution that obligates the government to protect a specific person, even if that person's life is in danger. The only authority the government has is a general authority to protect the group, but they can't protect the individuals. And that's a good, good decision because if they're authorized to protect the individual, what stops them from saying, we're putting in your, you in jail because we think you're in danger? <laughs> right? <laughs> so you want the, the power of decision to lie with the individual, not with the government. So, uh, <clears throat> anyhow, let's see. Law notes. Back to procedure. So anyway, we have um, all right the elements of, of the. Uh, I think I got the right one. Let's let's see that. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so here's the general structure of how a lawsuit is put together. Now we'll get into the actual where you put things on paper. But basically, when you're when you're talking common law, it all starts with a declaration. Okay. Now. In our paperwork, we'll probably call it an action. Or the, the equity equivalent of an action is a complaint. Okay? Now remember this, that in any paper, although you put certain titles on it, those titles do not control. What controls is what you actually say in the body. Now, when we, uh, we filed a case one time, I went up to the window and I had a counterclaim complete with uh, uh, who the original plaintiff and defendant was and who the counter plaintiff and who the counter defendant was. It was all laid out in proper form. But the clerk was ignorant, deputy clerk. And I didn't want to fight the battle and take it up to the big clerk. I just wanted to get the thing filed now. Okay? So the clerk looked at the paper and said, well, this is wrong. He says, you can't do this. And this says counterclaim. It has to say complaint. Okay? I said, okay, well, let's, what is it that's wrong? Let's go through it. So he, he pointed out these things. So he says, you'll have to fix it and bring it back later. I said, okay. And then right there at the window, by hand, I scratched out, I think it was counterclaim, and I put complaint, just like he wanted. And then I put a big X through the original plaintiff and, and defendant, you know, the original case which you'll see what I'm talking about later. But I made these scratch out, made these temporary changes, gave it to the clerk. He says, oh, okay. He can file it now. You see, your, your paperwork is supposed to be typewritten. Now, if you look up the legal definition of typewritten, typewritten means hand printing that's legible. <laughs> okay? That's why I knew I could do this. <laughs> and apparently the clerk knew that too. Yeah, it's got to be legible. That's the deal. So... Um, um, and since I used to be a draftsman, I print very clearly. 
So anyhow, um, the body still said counterclaim. The body still named who the who the counter defendants were. Still named the original case and so on. So when uh, uh, we got a demur from one of the uh, defendants, and this particular attorney complained about the fact that here it says complain up or it says uh, plaintiff and defendant up here and down here it's saying counterclaimant and counterclaimant. He says he was all confused. He didn't know what was what. Well, in our reply to his answer, or to his demur, actually, in our reply to his demur, we pointed out to him, well, it's what's in the body that controls. It doesn't matter what the heading says. Okay? Anyhow, so it, it starts with the declaration. Now, what is a declaration? A declaration is a statement of truth. Okay, and the customary way now here is where we're going to run into some rough waters here but at the end of the of the declaration you put um, that it was um, you say that I declare in a penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct okay now remember this I know that there's religious objections to that okay And as you've heard earlier, there are religious objections to making an oath. Okay? But you have to look at things in context. And the context here, as far as I'm concerned, is 100% secular. Has absolutely nothing to do with the spiritual side of life. Okay? Remember this, that my justification for this is that I have been informed that the Bible says that this is Satan's world until Armageddon comes. And those people who choose to walk with God may do so, but it's still Satan's world. He's in charge. That's that's what I've been told. Well, I understand. It's all BS, but nevertheless, that's what I've been told. Well, from my standpoint, it's all secular. It's all real world, not spiritual world. Okay? It's the world that I can see, hear, feel, and smell okay and so when I look at this this statement at the end that I declare under penalty of perjury I know that some people put religious attachments to that but there's nothing religious about it at all as far as the courts go what I see is is that are you promising to tell the truth or not and if they catch you lying they get to beat you up okay or put you in jail or something that's all it means to me and as far as I can see in the operation of the courts, that's all it means. You know, no, nobody brings a priest in to punish you unless he happens to be the, the judge who's wearing a priest's robe because originally all the judges were priests. But this is a separate branch. This is not the ecclesiastical branch of government. This is the, the judicial branch of government, which is different from... You know, originally in England you had the basic... Under the king, you had basic groupings. You had the uh, military, you had the nobility and their their deal. You had the church and their deal. The king of England is also head of the church. Okay, and so ecclesiastical law was totally separate from from uh, the secular law, which was separate from the law of the people. Okay, the common law, which is by the way Magna Carta. Did somebody here leave me a message about that confirmatio catarum? You did. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let's take a little byway on that because this helps to understand why the common law is good in the courts. The Constitution of the United States <clears throat> has the Seventh Amendment. And the Seventh Amendment says that in all, I think it's cases at law, where the amount in question is over twenty dollars, something like that, that the right the the decision of a jury is not reviewable. That Seventh Amendment has been broadly interpreted as meaning the common law, that you are protected, that that's your guarantee that the common law is available to you. But there's other places too. In um, in Article Three of the Constitution, in the uh, I believe it's the the, the the first paragraph it says something to the effect that the 
uh, judicial power of the United States is available in all cases in law and equity. Well, law means common law. Okay? So that is the... They, that, that identifies the fact that the, the common law is a part of our system. And the Seventh Amendment identifies the fact that the, the common law is above the statutory law. Why? Because no matter what accusation you bring in, when you're at law, the decision of the jury is not reviewable. Whereas, if it's a statutory case where a judge sits there, his decision is reviewable. And in fact, we even have a case, which we used in one of our cases, where the Supreme Court has said that a decision out of a court of record is not reviewable by them. They are subject to the, to the terms of that decision as well as the rest of the world. Not even they have the authority to override a court of records decision. Yes, sir. Right here, a uh, comment might be appropriate as far as uh, people's understanding about common law being not applying since uh, 1937, Erie versus Tompkins. Well, that that's true if you are if you start off on the wrong foot. If you start off on the statutory foot instead of the common law foot, that's true. So it, it all depends on which direction how you set up your court. You have to set up your court as a common law court. If you set up your court as a statutory court, then the statutes take precedence, and part of the statutes, one of the statutes, uh, I believe it's the Civil Code 22.2, I think it is, that says that the common law shall be the rule of decision so long as it's not repugnant to the statutes. Okay? But that's only if you're in a statute. It's like this. <clears throat> I don't know if you're aware of it, but uh, in California, if there is no law covering the situation, then the laws of Mexico apply. Were you aware of that? And this is because we came from Mexico. Mexico owned this area at one time. And when we got it, we got it before we were organized. And so, when we brought in our own system of law, we realized we didn't cover everything, so laws of Mexico are going to apply until we get... So, in the absence of a statute, you look to Mexican law. So, in the absence of a statute, we also look to common law. That's the rule of decision. And I suspect the common law would override the Mexican law. In fact, probably nobody looks at Mexican law anymore because we've been, we're so well established now in our own system. Mm-hmm. Most of those, most of those uh, interpretations of common law and then Erie versus Tompkins relate to the Uniform Commercial Code, but that's, of course, statutory. Yeah, it's all statutory. <clears throat> so, but if you start off in the common law, the Seventh Amendment is the constitutional recognition that the common law supersedes all others. Common law jury has the final say on everything. Okay? Now, what is common law? Well, if you most of your books tell you that the common law is um, prior court decisions. Okay? Well, that's part of it. Okay? But if you really want a casting concrete uh, understanding of what common law is, the first thing you have to understand is that the common law here is the common law of England as it stood in 1776, or maybe 1789. I think it's 1789 when our Constitution took effect. Okay? That's the common law. So now the question comes, well, what was the common law of England at that time? Well, it turns out you look at the Confirmatio Catarum, and this was written in the year November 5th, 1297. Yeah, that's right. Common law date, huh? <laughs> okay. And we'll enlarge this a little bit. And if you, look at, if you look at number three there of the first paragraph, number three near the bottom of the first paragraph, it says... Mm-hmm. And it says that our justices, sheriffs, mayors, and other ministers which under us have the laws of our land to guide shall allow said charters 
pleaded before them in judgment in all their points. That is, to wit, the Great Charter is the common law and the Charter of the Forest for the wealth of our realm. The great